Sure, they may have plenty of blue blood in Boston, but from what I just saw, they've got plenty of the other kind, too. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar. To Home Office, Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my search for your missing policyholder, Miss Michelle March. Or, she came in like a lion and went out on the lamb. Or, she should have been banned in Boston. Rent account, item one. $2.85. Railroad transportation, Hartford to Boston. Expense account item two, a dollar eighty. Cab fare to the corner of Longwood and Huntington Avenue. A half block from the apartment house that was Miss March's last known address. Boston may be called the cradle of liberty, but somebody else got rocked to sleep that morning on Longwood. <laughs> the shots came from two carbines and two men in one light tan club coupe parked across the street. <laughs> I waited long enough to memorize the license number as the pot rotted out of there, and then I headed for the victim. My heart was pounding, but not from exercise. He'd been sprayed coming out of a doorway that, in another 20 seconds, I would have been going in. But the coincidence didn't stop there. Oh, Take it easy now, will you? We'll get you some help. You know who did it? March. What? I, I didn't get you. Tell him. Tell him. Ask. Michelle March. Michelle March? Well, that's who I'm looking for. What's she got to do with it? Can you hear me? What's Michelle March got to do with it? Come on now. Try. I wonder if I should have stayed in heart. I didn't see her, but I sure heard it. Like a shooting gallery. I was inside the shop, and brother, that's where I stayed. Hey, mister, how is he? Can you tell? Yeah. Let's just say you don't need to stand back to give him air. He can't use it. While the two limelight-happy characters from the crowd argued about who was going to notify the police, I disappeared from the scene by way of that desk doorway, pausing inside just long enough to learn from the buzzer panel that Michelle March's apartment number was, unluckily, 213. bother to look for the apartment house manager. I didn't even bother to pick the lock. I put my shoulder to work on the door. It was an easy apartment to search, but it didn't offer anything to find. The only thing even faintly resembling a lead I found on the floor behind the bureau. A book of matches that advertised Boston's best bar by far, Flannery, with an address on Washington Street. About then, I decided that rather than being found at the scene of breaking and entering, I'd look up the police at the scene of murder. Oh, who are you there? What do you got to say about this? Oh, not much, Lieutenant. Shot from across the street by two men in a fan club coupe. Probably stolen. License number, Massachusetts 3R165. Weapons were carbines, 30 caliber army issue. Hmm. You sure of all that? Yeah. Yeah. This will tell you why I make it a habit to be sure of things. Oh. Dollar. Insurance investigator. Uh-huh. Hartford. Well, in a way, that makes two of you. Huh? I'm Lieutenant Bell, Dollar. Well, the major. The dead man was a local detective. Private license, good business, and a bad reputation. Name of? Uh, uh, something I can't pass out right now. Well, look, here's why I'm interested, Lieutenant. If friend detective was on a case, he could have been hired to find the same party I was hired to find. 
And since he was blasted at said party's last known address, it could be that somebody doesn't want said party found, which paints an interesting but uh, gloomy picture of my future. Who is this said party? A girl, Michelle March, reported to missing persons in New York yesterday by a worried sister who is also the beneficiary of a $25,000 insurance policy owned by Miss March. The insurer's Tri-State Life got the report from missing persons and hired me to find her. You think she's dead? I'll tell you when I find her. Yeah. Now, uh, what makes you think the deceased might have been looking for her, too? Because he mentioned her name just before he went bye-bye. Uh, where are you staying, Dolly? Uh, just in case we need you. Cartwright Hotel. Now, look, Lieutenant. You've got a murder and I've got a missing person. You can loaf if you want to, but I'm eager. I want to talk to the apartment house manager. Any objections? No. Go right ahead, darling. Good luck to you. I've managed room and houses for over 30 years in Boston, some very nice ones. <laughs> this is the first murder I've ever had. Oh, why did fate point at me? Fate didn't point, Mrs. Macy. The gentleman was knocked off because he was involved with one of your tenants. Oh, oh that's impossible. I've tried so hard. References, my own personal observation. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Mrs. Macy. In fact, the more personal your observations were, I'm glad I'll be. Well, it isn't that I snoop, Mr. Dahl. Oh, of course not, Mrs. Macy. <sighs> Who was it? Michelle March, 213. Oh, she's a lovely girl. But her habits were quite irregular. Often came in late. Oh. I understand she hasn't been staying in her apartment for the past two weeks. Do you know where she went? Well, I know, but I, I did happen to be just outside her door when she came out with a suitcase and her gentleman caller, her employer, I believe she said... Something about some work they had to do in the country. Uh-huh. She leave a forwarding address? Uh, she had little reason to do that. Why, all the time she's been here, the only letter she's gotten is from somebody in Chicago. One a month. A man, I'd say, from the penmanship. Did I get one this month, though? Do you, uh, by any chance, remember what those letters said? Oh, you young upstart. I'm only trying to help. I know, Mrs. Macy. You're a lovable old gossip. <laughs> After Mrs. Macy chased me out of her apartment, I questioned some of Michelle's second-floor neighbors. What they gave me only augmented the story I already had. She hadn't been seen in the company of anyone for four or five months until Dapper, Medium Build, and Swarthy took over. All of them had seen him. None of them knew his name. But they all agreed he was the guy Michelle March had marched away with. Everything I learned added up to a dame getting tired of waiting for somebody in Chicago and ducking out with somebody else. It would have looked that simple if it hadn't been for that detective who had so recently taken up new headquarters in the city morgue. Expense account, item three, $4.75, drinks and dinner. After which, expense account, item four, 180, taxi ride. Taken on the strength of the weak clue I found on Michelle's apartment floor. The match folder from Boston's best bar by far, Flannery. Flannery's look like they wouldn't want to know how old you are, but how many stretches and in what prisons. Above a row of greasy bottles, the wall behind the bar was covered with pictures of fighters. Right from old John L. up to Rocky Graziano. But none of them looked as brutal as the eight or ten gorillas who had their feet on the brass rail. I decided this was no place to ask for a lady. So I asked for a drink. Yeah. A straight rye. Double. You've never been in before. Where are you from? I'm trying to forget. Has, um... Blackie been around lately? Who's Blackie? Well, maybe that's not his full name. It's the one I knew him by. Uh, he wore a lot of sharp suits, you know, about medium build, dark, swarthy. That could be anybody. Now, drink your drink, pay for it, and move along. Now, wait a minute. Now, I haven't got anything against the guy. I'm looking for a dame that's with him, see? What's the freeze for? I need the room, expecting a private crowd. 
Now, beat it. Try more, Flannery. Oh, Maybe I want to talk to these guys. I'll see that, Flannery. Yeah, I'll hold you. I'll I'll get closed up again if I get any more trouble this week. Take them outside, Roxy. Huh? Shut up. What's this Niles' name you're looking for? Michelle March. You know her? Yeah. Let's go someplace and talk. Nice for the invitation, but... Let go of the arm. You'll get gangrene when the circulation is cut off. Sorry. Come on. What makes you so upset about the lost Michelle? What do you want with Louis Marine? Louis Marine? If he's the guy she's with, all I want him to do is to point her out. You and me might get along at that. It'd be worth plenty to... Look out! Get this fire for Hey! Come on. The car they were in was different, but those carbines sounded the same. I rubbed my nose raw, trying to bury my head in that sidewalk. I knew they had to empty those carbines sometime, but instead of sounding better, it started to sound worse. I twisted my head, shot a look at the street, saw one of the attackers in the process of falling out of one of the windows of the gun car. Closed my eyes again and realized why they never let my kind of insurance investigator be a policyholder. I'd been sent to find a missing girl, and there I was in the middle of another Boston massacre. You are listening to Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. full 20 seconds after the smoke of battle had started to clear for me to realize that I'd been saved by the arrival of fire support from an unexpected source, the police. I looked around for my new friend and brother target, Roxy, but he had disappeared. A wave of suspicion broke over my flow of thought with this question. How did it happen that all those cops with all those guns just happened to be in all those hiding places waiting for those gunmen to drive up and open up? Answer? A hunter's stew like that usually calls for a pigeon. I didn't feel like flying, but I did. Straight back to my hotel. With one landing and a newsstand. An evening paper gave me everything else I needed, except the feathers. But I wasn't exactly cooing when I got to my hotel room phone and put a call through to the Boston police. South Precinct, Sergeant Miller. Give me Lieutenant Bell in homicide. One moment. Homicide, Lieutenant Bell. This is Dollar, Lieutenant. I... Oh, Dollar, sure. I'm glad to hear from you. I'll have your badge for this. What? What did you say? The evening paper. Quote, Boston private detective whose name has been withheld by police was slain today, presumably to stop his search for a missing girl. It was learned by this paper from reliable sources. Oh, not Dollar. But another investigator still alive has joined the hunt for the girl. Well, I... Johnny Dollar, well-known Hartford insurance sleuth, checked into room 705 at the Cartwright Hotel today. Well, you want more? Why, uh, I can't understand it. I, I told the boys not to say a word. I think the boys didn't. Oh, now, see here, a man would have to stoop pretty low to use methods like that. You probably touch your toes every morning for practice. Well, I hope you got the results of your stakeout in front of Flannery's. You got two hot carbines and a hot car. The evidence that could have talked, those gunmen, are so full of police lead that your only chance of learning anything now is to find somebody strong enough to pick them up and write with them. Now, wait a minute, Dollar. You know who hired them? Well, I'll find out. Now, when you get confused, check with me. I think I know. Now, do I get the name of that private detective? The deceased? <laughs> well, I don't see any harm. Uh... Bernard Knight. Hired by? Uh, well, all right, Dollar. If you'll cooperate, I will. Now, according to his files, he was hired by uh, Roxy Morris to find the girl. Now, who hired the gunman? I think, but don't know that they were hired by a gent named Louis Marine to stop Roxy Morris from finding Michelle March. Why? We'll have more about that later. But if you'll put a search on that pair of names, I'll look for a good night's sleep. After that sidewalk, it was easy to find. Huh? Hmm? Oh, Boston. Uh, good morning. Hello, is this Mr. Dollar? Wait a minute, shall I pick you 
you have brought the floor. Uh, who is this? Is this Mr. Dollar? Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, this is Michelle March. Huh? Oh, oh well, uh, uh, good morning, Michelle. I've been looking for you. That's why I called. I read that you were hired by my insurance company. Yeah, that's right. They don't like disappearing policyholders. Well, let me tell you this. If they want to save the money, they'll have to pay for me. Stop looking for me. What are you afraid of? That Roxy Morris will follow me? What do you know about Roxy? Well, he'd like to find you and Louis Marine. What did he tell you? Oh, what counts is that I filled in what he didn't tell me. Namely, that he was in Chicago for a year, and you were supposed to be waiting for him in this fatal apartment on Longwood Avenue. But instead, Louis Marine landed, took the situation well in hand, and captured you for himself. You're just trying to sound surprise, aren't you? If it fits, keep it on approval. Now, the point is, there are too many people looking for you to stay lost. Where can I meet you? How do I know I can trust you? I can't trust anybody. Look, I'm still working for the insurance company, so my greatest interest is keeping you alive, not selling you out. What about the police? Well, my promises aren't equipped with lifetime guarantees, but I'll do what I can. If you tell all, and if the story is big enough, they should be willing to make a deal. It's big, all right. They'll clear something out of their books that's been there for a year. Where do I meet you? You know where Charlestown is? Well, I know it's part of Boston. Take the subway and get off at City Square. An hour from now. I'll be in a bar. The gangplank. On Chelsea. Near the Navy Yard. Okay, sweetie. I'll be there. Up until now, whoever's been doing the shooting has used everything but battleships. Even though Michelle's story sounded like trap bait, cheesy indeed, I had to take a chance. I dove into a cab and had the cab drive into the top of Hanover Street and down to Boston's North End. Playing quiz games with strangers in that section is called Take It or Lump It. But a few well-placed 20s led me to a neighborhood undertaker who had the officially unproved reputation of creating a large demand for his own services. We swapped donations. I gave him 50 bucks, and he gave me a large out of the corner of his mouthful. Uh, listen to me good. Uh, about a year ago, the laws picked up a Roxy Morris on a suspicion. They had a good idea. He's a heist of the 75G payroll. But there were no witnesses. He didn't believe in us. Roxy knew they'd watch him, so he hightailed it out of town. But he didn't detect the loot with him. The boys around the here got it back on the grapevine. He was uh, suffering from the shorts. So everybody figured he had the dough uh, stashed away uh, somewhere right around the here. Is that all? Have you got anything else to tell me? Yes. Goodbye. I didn't like the way that undertaker said goodbye. <laughs> I legged it up to the subway station marked Union, went down in and caught a train for Charlestown. Once at City Square, a three-block walk down Chelsea Street produced the gangplank bar, which in turn produced that nose-bruising smell which comes from slopping beer on sawdust. Out of place in the place sat Michelle March. She was a good looker with a bad look. And if I had been Roxy Morris, I would have elected her the last national bank. I flopped into a booth beside her. She turned her head my way, looked me straight in the kisser, blew a smoke ring at me, and popped two words through it. You dollar? Yep, I'm dollar. You march? I'm Michelle March. Well, so far so good. It's nice hearing you breathe. That means Tri-State Insurance can keep its nice $25,000. Only if you keep me this way, Mr. Dollar. And that might prove to be a difficult thing to do. Oh, maybe not so difficult. Why not? Well, you indicated yourself that your magnetic personality might suddenly attract a few steel jacket bullets. That means there'll have to be somebody to pull the trigger. So all I have to do is to sit around and see who tries to take a shot at the target. You, and we've got our man. It's not that easy. I'm in trouble three ways. And it's hard to see three ways at once. Look, I know all about Roxy Morris. He swiped $75,000 and gave it to you to mine. You don't know the half of it. Two months after Roxy was gone, a guy named Louis Marine came to me with a story that Roxy had sent for $20,000. I gave it to him. Then he told me that Roxy had never sent for him. And that if I squawked, he'd convince Roxy that I'd fallen in love with him and just given him the money. 
He had the battery tip off the police. He had me going and coming. Nice fellow. He wouldn't leave me alone. He made me give him 15,000 more of Roxy's money. And two weeks ago, I got word through to Roxy in Chicago. He blew up. Turned on me. I've been running from him ever since. He wants his 75,000, all of it. And I haven't got it. Oh, seems like you've been taking chances all the way. Now, you know what I want you to do? No, what? Take one more. I told Michelle what I had in mind for her, during the next few hours at least, and grabbed a cab back across the bridge into the north end. Expense account item five, fifty dollars. Another donation to my expensive undertaker. This time I paid him for talking, but not to me. Then I took over the telephone and dialed my way through to the guy to whom I was about to give a chance of becoming the ding dong daddy of the Boston Police Force, Lieutenant Bell. Yes, Della, this is Lieutenant Bell. Bell, how would you like to get the goods on Roxy Morris? I'd like a twine. Okay. And along with that, how would you like to pin a receiving stolen property wrap on Louis Marine? I hope you aren't just being salty, darling. No, I'm not, Lieutenant. Now, look. Uh, you may have to do some trading with a gal on this deal. Yeah. You may have to promise her some time off for verbal good behavior. Well, such things are possible. All right, what's the pitch? Listen, I have baited a tall, thin granite trap for Roxy Morris and Louis Marine. The bait is Roxy's ex-girlfriend, Michelle March. Okay. What's that? I had a tipster call Roxy Morris and tell him that Louis Marine was meeting Michelle at a certain place at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. I also had Mr. Blabbermouth call Louis Marine and tell him that Michelle is meeting Roxy at the same time and the same place. What? I had him tell each of the gentlemen that Michelle was meeting the other one with what's left of the money in cash. Oh, you started a war, darling. Uh, but if it does the trick, it's worth it. All right, all right. Uh, what's my move? First, call the call the place where I've arranged a surprise party and uh, tell them to get rid of the public. But, uh, also tell them to let a girl named Michelle March come and go as she pleases. Also me. Oh, don't tell me you've set this thing up in a public place. Where is it? Lieutenant Bell, yeah. what I want is for those two characters to run up a blind alley. And when I say up, oh, brother... They got the word that Michelle meeting would be held at the top of the Bunker Hill Monument. Oh, no. And you might remember what General Prescott almost said. Don't fire till you see the red in their eyes. I was back in Charlestown and at the base of the Bunker Hill Monument at a quarter to three. The door of the museum at the bottom was open, but a state park officer stood by its side. I told him who I was, and he nodded me through the bronze doors. Uh, officer, did, uh, Miss March get here? Yes, sir, young man. She went up the shaft. Oh, uh, well, look, can I run the elevator myself? Not that it's any elevator. Just step two to three hundred of them. Oh. Ow, this may be going to heaven the hard way, but here goes. Halfway up the winding granite stairs, I yelled for Michelle. But she either didn't hear me or just didn't want to answer. I kept going and hoping. As I came closer to the top, I tried yelling again. Still no answer. Finally, I made it. Up into the observation landing at the top. Michelle was there. She still wouldn't talk but she had written me a note. Beside her crumpled figure was a vial that hadn't been filled with perfume. The note was short and to the point. Dear Johnny Dollar, I still want to help, but I hadn't better be around here alive when everybody gets here. And it was time to shell. As I bent over to see what kind of bye-bye medicine she'd taken, I heard something that might mean a sudden dose of lead to the head for me. <laughs> Either Morris or Marine had landed, and there I was stuck at the top with a bait that had suckered them into a trap, which suddenly turned out to be mine. Waiting up there in that tiny room for death to come get me would have killed me anyway, so I started down. With the pounding of my heart and my own steps on the granite blocks, I heard the pitter-patter of anything but tiny feet come charging up a narrow staircase. Whoever was coming up, and I both slowed down. My heart didn't. I crept around a curve and my eyes went into a head-on collision with a pair staring back. What are you doing here? Uh, I, I'm a tourist, uh, Roxy. You may be right, white guy. You may be taking a trip. Who's up there? Uh, oh, uh, up there? Oh, 
I don't know who they are. Just some girl with a guy. She keeps calling Louie. Okay. Let me buy. Easy now. Don't try anything. <laughs> Roxy Morris tagged me with a butt of a 32 going by. But lying there with my head against the cold granite inside wall of the monument brought me back. And conscious was a very dangerous condition for me to be in. Because charging up the stairs came another pair of unfriendly feet that couldn't have belonged to anybody but Louis Marine. Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, up until somebody hit me on the head, I was trailing Roxy Morris and his girl. They're up there? Sure, Louis. Yeah, they're up there. Then let me buy. Come on. Get up out of my way. Okay. okay. Go ahead and buy. Yeah. But wait a minute. I got an idea. Come on, chum. Ahead of me. Up you go. You can affront for me. Move! Louie had a gun at my back. And Roxy had one waiting for me up front. We took the last few steps up to the top real quiet like. When my eyes came level to the floor of the observation room, Roxy was bending over Michelle. But he snapped up in a hurry, and his right hand was loaded with heat. Louis pushed me ahead of him, up and in. I stood there between them, listening to them grind their teeth at each other, with one foot under Michelle's arm. Then I got two big shocks. A scream from Michelle, just before she snatched my legs out from under me. What are you doing alive? I don't know. I don't know. I guess I, I didn't take enough. Well, whatever you're doing alive, I'll tell you one thing. Your two boyfriends sure took care of each other. Come on. Let me get you out of here. Oh. I didn't think I'd be able to carry me down all those stairs. Now I have to carry you. account, item six, $20, to the hospital, having Michelle's stomach pumped out. And the way Michelle took my suggestion that she voluntarily turn herself over to the police was very good. Lieutenant Bell was very cooperative. Otherwise, I might let it be known that the reason that he didn't show up on time to help me in the 1949 Battle of Bunker Hill was because he forgot to reset his watch at the end of daylight saving time. He showed up for our three o'clock appointment at four. Uh, expense account total, yeah, seven hundred and eighty-six dollars and no cents. Signed, yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Bill Boucher, Myra Marsh, Dick Ryan, Larry Dobkin, Charles Seal, and Dorothy Lovett. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Be sure to be with us next Saturday, October 1st, when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. That's right. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be heard on Saturday evenings starting next Saturday. And look at who's going to be here at the same time on Sundays. The world's most famous blockhead, Charlie McCarthy, accompanied by a man who shadows him closely as Johnny shadows the suspect, Edgar Bergen. Yes, Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen have joined the great parade of stars to CBS along with Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, Horace Hyde, and Red Skelton, whose show starts next Saturday, or rather next Sunday also. Don't miss the first hilarious appearance of Charlie and Bergen on most of these same CBS stations at the same time next Sunday night and every Sunday thereafter. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.